let's breathe. To breathe is a lot more involved and a lot more complicated than a person might imagine, and there's a lot more stuff actually going on. So let's do that. Let's take a nice deep breath and fill those lungs as full as air as you can get them. Hold it for a second and then let it out. Do that again, but this time pay attention to what's happening to the shoulders. Nice deep breath in. Hold it. Breath out. And what you perhaps notice is that as you breathe in, the shoulders rise. And the rising shoulders actually helps to pull on the ribs and to allow the ribs to separate a little farther from each other and to expand outwards. And this increases the internal volume of the rib cage, which allows the lungs to expand and fill it up. To breathe out, the shoulders fall. The muscles, the intercostal muscles shown here in between the ribs, actually contract, pulling the ribs back down and closer together. And then this helps to squeeze the air out of the lungs. You see here that the diaphragm is now in a relaxed position, sort of a dome shaped or a upward curvature to the shape of the diaphragm there. And if we go back and look at breathing in as a much flatter structure. So increase the, the volume of the rib cage and drop the diaphragm down, and that creates a vacuum inside the lungs. And really breathing is about pressure. So when you increase the internal volume of the rib cage, you decrease the pressure inside the lungs. And that then sucks air in through the nose. Also, it can come through the mouth as well. And so that vacuum effect fills the lungs with air. To breathe out, you increase the pressure of the lungs, which squeezes the air back out. And so you vacuum air in, squeeze it out. Vacuum it in, squeeze it out. And that's the general process of breathing. And there's a lot of pressure uh, physics going on inside the lungs there that I won't overwhelm you with, but it's relatively complicated. And as long as the pressure works, so to breathe in, the pressure becomes lower than atmospheric pressure, and to breathe out, then the pressure becomes higher than atmospheric pressure, and then breathing works. But there are muscles involved. There are... Uh, bones involved in that process, and as that diaphragm is contracting, it's pushing the abdominal organs down out of the way, and when it relaxes, those abdominal organs typically push the diaphragm back up. So that helps to both increase and decrease uh, pressure on the lungs and the uh, rib cage. Breathing and breathing rates are actually controlled by the brain. So the brain is constantly monitoring the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the lungs, or in, in the blood in general. And if the carbon dioxide levels in the blood get too high, the brain tells the lungs to breathe faster, to inflate and deflate faster. So that's going to trigger that breathing in process and that breathing out process to happen more rapidly. That will then help to exchange gases with the blood so you'll bring more oxygen in and make it available for pickup by the blood and the red blood cells and that will then pick up more carbon dioxide out of the blood into the lungs and then be breathed back out. When that carbon dioxide level drops then breathing can slow down. So that's part of the triggering process that goes along with physical activity or with any sort of uh, scenario in which carbon dioxide levels would go up. For folks who happen to be on oxygen because their body isn't doing a good job of gas exchange, it is uh, sometimes a person might say that they feel like they can't breathe and they need their oxygen levels turned up. And just a word of caution on that. If you increase oxygen levels in the blood, you can actually cause a person to stop breathing. And this can then lead to a cascade of events that can actually be fatal or certainly uh, seriously harmful to a person something as simple as turning up someone's oxygen levels. So let me briefly explain. I mentioned that the brain is monitoring carbon dioxide levels. And if the CO2 levels go up, then the breathing rate goes up, the CO2 levels go down, the breathing rate goes down, and that's fine. But someone who is experiencing probably some sort of respiratory problem experiences chronically high levels of carbon dioxide. And the brain eventually says, you know what, carbon dioxide is always high. 
So that's not really telling me anything. And I'm bored of looking at that, so I'm going to look at oxygen levels instead. And if oxygen levels go up, the breathing rate goes down. If oxygen levels go down, the breathing rate goes up. And that will still somewhat work to a limited effect. But here's the problem. If you turn up someone's oxygen levels, that then increases the oxygen levels in the brain. And the brain then says, you don't need to breathe as much, or perhaps don't need to breathe at all for a little bit, because there's plenty of oxygen here. And from an oxygen perspective, that's not a big deal. But from a system-wide acidic control, that's a big deal. So your body wants to keep the acidity of the blood and of the various tissues at an appropriate level. And if you're not breathing, you're not dumping carbon dioxide from the body, which means that CO2 levels are going up in the blood. And when CO2 goes up, pH goes down. So the blood becomes more acidic as CO2 levels go up. And if the uh, blood becomes too acidic, what happens basically is respiratory failure and uh, things like the brain shuts off simply because the CO2 levels, the carbon dioxide, caused the acidity to go down. So you can actually induce coma and brain death by having uh, something as simple as the oxygen levels too high, which turned off breathing. The turned off breathing then increased the acidity of the blood. So someone who's on oxygen and experiencing shortness of breath, there needs to be some examination done before turning up oxygen. And if oxygen is turned up, it will be done very, very slowly to try to make sure that you don't trigger this sort of uh, stopping breathing by providing too much oxygen too quickly. What we see here is someone with a CPAP or a breathing machine that they would utilize at night to help them breathe better at night. So more and more we're discovering, or more and more it's being diagnosed, we should say, sleep apnea. And sleep apnea occurs when the epiglottis, remember from previous discussions, the epiglottis helps to determine does something go down the trachea to the lungs or does it go down the esophagus to the stomach. So sometimes the epiglottis doesn't do a very good job staying open like it should. Sometimes the tongue gets in the way. Uh, sometimes there are just some complications in the airways while sleeping. And so sometimes you might sleep on your side. Uh, a lot of times people with sleep apnea actually, if they would lose weight, their sleep apnea problems would go away. Uh, but one very common treatment is to give them this breathing machine. And basically what it does is it's a constant positive pressure device. And that means that it's blowing air into your nose, which helps to inflate the airways and helps to maintain a positive pressure on the lungs so that you're less likely to have the epiglottis close off. You're less likely to have the throat or the tongue get in the way because of this positive pressure. And so that then ensures that you have better oxygen flow into the lungs, which means better oxygenation of the body in general. Uh, folks with sleep apnea before treatment would often describe themselves as having poor quality of sleep, or certainly they wouldn't feel good when they wake up in the mornings. Uh, they might experience uh, waking up often, often with a gasping sort of response because their body has become oxygen deprived as they were not breathing. And so these devices often help improve the quality of sleep. You feel better, you have energy the next day, you don't wake up gasping all the time because it's helping to keep the airway open. And when the airway is open, then you can actually move oxygen into the lungs, carbon dioxide out, and the whole system just works that much better. So people with sleep apnea before and after treatment often report dramatic, significant differences in their quality of life overall, really, when they have these devices and use them. A common consideration in the respiratory system is what happens to it if you smoke. And the short answer is you destroy your respiratory system when you smoke. And that's not really any great surprise. Everybody knows really that smoking isn't good for you, but a number of people choose to do it anyway. And then they put themselves at increased risk of lung cancer and uh, all kinds of respiratory diseases and problems. And, and quite simply, you're going to get a cold more often. 
You're going to get bronchitis more often. You're going to get sick more often, probably because your lungs, as a relatively susceptible mucous membrane to pathogens, are chronically irritated by all of these things found in that cigarette smoke. So a relatively new thing in the world of smoking is the idea of vaping. And so you're eliminating tobacco, you're eliminating uh, tar, and many of those other very harmful, irritating substances from cigarettes. So a lot of people think that vaping is safe. Now, I would beg to differ on that. You're still um, experiencing an addiction problem because you still have nicotine in that process. So you still have an addiction. It's just not an addiction that is as likely to cause respiratory problems from that perspective. But it still is very potentially harmful to the system for sure. For one, it's very easy to overdose on nicotine. You can only smoke so many cigarettes in a certain period of time. It's just physically only possible to do so much. But with vaping, it's possible to overdose because you can suck in a lot of nicotine in a very short period of time. And uh, probably a, an entire pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine could be consumed in a vaping device in the matter of time it would normally take to smoke one or two, maybe three cigarettes in a row. So overdose and basically nicotine toxicity and poisoning could be a problem. And also in the last year or so they've discovered, and especially in black market products or in products that are made in China especially, they've discovered that a lot of these devices actually have vitamin E in them. And uh, that's actually harmful to the body, believe it or not. Vitamin E, if you rub it on your skin or you consume it in food, is fine. But when you inhale vaporized vitamin E oils into the lungs, it actually burns them. So your lungs can't handle that kind of uh, oil, and it causes chemical burns to the lungs. Obviously, respiratory distress and, and a lot of problems there. So... Uh, especially on the cheaper end of the scale for those, but nonetheless, the, the process includes the possibility of that kind of outcome. So, uh, really, I would say that is vaping better than tobacco use? Uh, probably so. Is it safe? Absolutely not. And uh, I would propose that the real risks and the real potential problems that could come from vaping, we really won't fully understand for another 10 years or so until it's been around longer, until we've had an opportunity to, to observe some of the things that might happen doing this sort of thing. So vaping is in its infancy, but still has a number of documented for sure problems and concerns along with it, and probably has a lot of others as well. So perhaps you might use vaping as a way to help to stop smoking in that process, and that certainly would be okay to use it as a piece of the, of the puzzle. But I would propose that vaping for the sake of vaping uh, because you want to, because you like that nicotine fix, is not a good idea. So just avoid all of those sorts of uh, things, whether it's real cigarettes, e-cigarettes, any kind of, of sort of uh, use of these products is really not good for you. Hopefully this all made sense and uh, you learned a lot. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.